everyone, and welcome back to the Digital Nomad World Weekly Series. I'm Becky, and once again, I'm going to be your host. And once again, we have Christy Garavito with us. We just spoke with her in our last episode about Madrid, Spain, and now we're going to be talking about working remotely as a translator. Christy, thank you so much for coming back. Thank you for having me, Becky. It's nice to be back. It's really nice to chat with you today about this topic in particular, because I think what you do is something a lot of people might be able to do, and they may not be thinking about how it is when you do it remotely. So we want to dive into that today. So first of all, I think you said this a little bit in the last episode, but for those who didn't watch, can you tell us about your background and how you started your digital nomad journey? Mm -hmm. So I'm a translator and I've been a nomad for over 12 years. I... Um, well, I study communication studies, but then I decided at some point that I was more interested in languages. So I moved to Argentina to Buenos Aires to study translation. And then after I finished my course there, I started working online and that like naturally started giving me, taking me to other places. So I needed to study another language and then I moved around and I started moving around to study. But then I realized I could also move around just to like leave in places I wanted to go. So ever since I've been working online with clients online and translating for different types of clients for, yeah, over 12 years now. I, okay, that's really cool, first of all, that you knew so early on what you wanted to do. Did you imagine that when you were studying translation, it was going to be something you were going to be doing remotely from the very beginning? Uh, the funny thing is, no, I started traveling when I was around 18. I was an au pair in in the United States and then I said I got that's when I got interested in languages but when I moved to Argentina I was truly to study because they had the degree there and we didn't have it in Mexico where I'm originally from but then I think the the degree took me organically to be a nomad instead of like a lot of people you know have certain jobs and then they decide to be nomads so they change their lifestyle for me it was like I realized that all of the work, work was going to be remote and then I was sitting in Buenos Aires after living there for like a few years being like, okay, I can be here. I can be somewhere else learning another language and doing this job. So that organically took me to be a nomad. It was more the job, you know, move, like pushed me to be a nomad. Yeah. I remember you told us before that you're a really OG nomad. Like you were going to these places, maybe cafes, and you didn't know if there were even any other nomads. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. Like, I started, like, in Germany because what the first language I incorporated was uh, German after English. And I was living there and I was working, like, at this point from Starbucks because they didn't have these specialty coffee places. And I, I was, like, the weird person that worked from her computer from, like, coffee shops, which it was hard to explain to people. Now it's become easier because people has they have more knowledge about it, but before it was like, but what do you mean? But you work online, but you, and it was hard to um, explain. It was also hard to find like like-minded people. And I think, yeah, it was one of the few people that was doing that at, at that time. Yeah, I remember, I don't know where you would put the line, but before maybe 2018, 20, definitely before 2016, if you said you were working only online, it was this amazing thing and people just assumed that you didn't work. <laughs> yeah, it was like, I think for me, it was 12 years ago. So that's like 2012. Wow. Yeah, 2012. It was a while ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. People assumed I didn't work. I was on vacation all the time. I always hated that. I was like, no, I work a lot. You just think that, you know, I'm I'm doing, have, playing games on my computer. I don't know. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's because you don't go to the office every day, they don't realize a lot of people don't realize you work a lot of hours. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, OK, you have this degree in translation. How did you get your first work? OK, so I as I was studying, I met this other translator that he he was older than me, so he'd been doing it for a while and he started giving me work. So he will pass some of work from his clients. To me and I started like so that gave me like a food in the business and then he recommended this platform to use this platform to get clients but I have to make sure I paid for it and at the beginning I was a student so I was like oh I don't know if I can afford that but then as soon as I did it like after I graduated I did it I used it for a while without paying and then I started paying and then I started getting clients 
that I really like. So uh, of course you get all kind of clients, but you start getting like, you know, you start learning and that's how I got uh, actually uh, to, to, you know, to work as a translator, but that's the degree I got in Buenos Aires. That's exactly when, where, you know, what I did there. Okay, so this older translator, was he in your degree program or how did you meet this person? Because I'm trying to uh, show went, people how you might start, you know, with the we network. We met at a bar. <laughs> you met at, where? We met at a bar. I think oh. we met at a bar. In and then someone was talking, he's like, I'm a translator. I'm starting to be a translator. And then he's like, oh, give me your info. And then he started sending me work. But of course, you think at that point, he was paying me probably half the money that he got for every like project, but it was a good opportunity to get my food. And, and then he get, he'll give me feedback and it was kind of a practice that I did for a while. And then I realized when I graduated, I'm like, oh, I can do this online. So that was like a big, um, you know, like a good start. But yeah, it was a random meet, like meeting, but you can meet people either university or, you know, doing courses and stuff. You start to get in people, to, you know, to get to know people that are in the same business. Okay, what I heard from you is like you were social, you went out of your place, and then you told yeah. somebody what you did. And I can tell you the same thing happened to me in a bar once. I got a fantastic job for years from doing the same mm -hmm. thing. Share what you're going through at that moment. I'm looking for work or I'm, I do this. It's amazing what might happen. Mm -hmm. Networking, networking and being honest and being like, hey, I'm looking for opportunities. If you heard, because people tend to like to connect people. So they're like, oh, I know someone that's the same and you let me connect you and it's good. And, and the same the same way it goes to when people come to you asking for advice or connection, it's good to have that. It's good karma to do both, right? Because at the end of the day, if we help each other, it's easy. It's just like a contact or like putting two people, you know, in contact is easy and you can help someone. Yeah, it's so true. Okay, this platform that you mentioned, does it still exist? Yes, I still use it. It's pretty good. It's called Pros, P R O Z, uh, and you can pay yearly and monthly. I think I, I do yearly, but it is one of the most. I mean, there's several platforms there, like Translator Cafe, uh, Translators.com, I think. But this one, Pros, is um is very specific because they ask you a lot of questions as a translator when you build your profile. They ask you for your degree where you got it from, you have to upload it. So it's very specific that uh, they recruit or they their users are people that are certified and trained. Whereas, you know, there's a big misconception that if you're bilingual, you can be a translator. And that's not the case. There's a lot of like, um, you need to have some kind of training in translation and writing because there's a lot of uh, false friends and translation traps that you can't avoid if you're not trained you know, uh, to be a translator. Also, it's good to have a proofreader to proofread all your work. So what happened with PROS is they uh, make sure you have some kind of training on it, experience, and then they usually have really good clients that enroll in the website to get translators, proofreaders, copywriters, everything related to languages. Okay, so I don't want to dishearten people that just heard you say you, re you really need some training in this before you can do it. Do you know, besides a four-year degree, of some specific training programs that people might be able to, to take to get better or have a better shot at doing this as possible work? I think it depends on the language you speak because, you know, as a translator, you're only supposed to translate into your mother tongue and as a proofreader is the same, you know, like you can speak many languages and like translate from many languages to your mother tongue, but um, that's what a translators should do only translate because it's the one language that you can you know speak a hundred percent and if you do I mean I don't know like it depends on the country you're at but there's several lately more like training some proofreading translating creating right uh, writing all different types of uh, courses where you can improve your language skills because you need to like master your own language to be able to translate but also there are so many, like I said before, language traps or false friends that you can, you know, if you have some kind of training, you'll know because, you know, there's an example, I'm really quick, that when I was in the University of Arizona doing a court interpreting course, they, they told us about like, you know, sometimes they didn't have enough interpreters. So they'll use people that were just bilingual. And there was this case of these 
drug deal going on in the house and they asked, you know, they were trying to come, they were asking the roommates about it to see if they were complicit or not. And the judge asked the, the person like, do you know there was drug deals going on in the house? And he said in English, I ignored it. And the, the interpreter said, I lo ignore, which in Spanish means I was aware of it, but I decided to ignore it. And this person got jail time because of, I mean, it's like sad, but also it's, it's, it's just to realize how important it is to get some kind of training to be able to avoid these kind of problems that may arise from being a bilingual person, but not uh, being a trained or certified translator. And literally lives could be on the line. I mean, if you're doing medical translation, for example. Um, yeah, but I thank you for like sharing with us that there are many courses out there, but also that it's important to take one or, or many, and that will help you also with your resume, like have a better chance to get these jobs. Mm -hmm. That's true. So yeah, oh. that's the website. Yeah, sorry, I will recommend. Yeah. Thank you. Top, like, well, okay, well, we're going to put a link to that under the description. Um, so also, what is your normal translation day of work like? Do you, how many hours would you say that you do? And what kind of work do you work on? What kind of things do you translate? I've done several different translations. I specialize a lot of, from German to Spanish. I did a lot of automotive and engineering, which was good. And, but um, I've had a client for the last 10 years. It was on and off, which is a fashion client. And I've been doing for the last five years, they launched their website online in Mexico for like, um, you know, like their online shop. And I started doing that. I built a team for them and we are doing now, we're working mostly for, for this client. And what happens is they send us projects, there's this platform. We Then I divide the projects, the work between like the team. And then we work, I'd, I'll say I'll work like five hours a day uh, between proofreading and translating and then doing some administrative work. But yeah, we'll say five hours a day, but it's project-based mostly, but this client keeps us busy throughout the week. That's incredible, 10 years as a client. Did you find this client on the platform? They found me actually, which is in on the platform. They I got an email from them and well, you know, like you have to sign a lot of NDAs with like this type of clients. And uh they sent me a message and they were gonna open in Mexico. This was I think more than 10, it's about 12 years ago, I'll say now. Um, that they sent me an email and then they asked me for a test. And this is what a lot of these companies do. The first thing they ask is for a test to see your skills, and then they send it to proofreaders. So they asked me for a test, I did it. And then once I passed, they, they approved, they call me and they're like, well, you know, we're this company and we're gonna open in Mexico. They hadn't been, you know, they it was the first time they opened in Latin America. So it was the first store. And then I, it was good. I mean, at some point, I mean, at the beginning it was like a lot of work and then it fluctuated. So I started to get other clients. And then once they opened the online shop, as they said, they, you know, we had more work with them. So we're kind of, exclusively working with them but it's always you know you, you you always have a few clients on the loop when they need you yes as freelancers we know you got to have more than one client just in case probably sure. multiple ones and and this platform a, a place to go where you can find more is very helpful you mentioned this platform like there was an unpaid and a paid version what was the difference, if you could feel any, between, like, you, do you just have access to more jobs if you're paying for the... Well, it's a big difference, because to begin with, you, uh, when you pay, you start, you're the first one to get to the jobs. When the companies post jobs, you have access, like, 24 hours before the unpaid members, and also there is a pool where clients can look for only paid members. So since there's so many, there's a lot of users in this website, it's pretty successful, when I did it, um, when I did the unpaid version, I didn't have enough clients. And when I did the paid version, it was a big difference. You could tell immediately, like, well, you get you get first dips for, you know, every uh, uh, job opportunity. But also when they search for you, I guess the fact that you're a paid member, companies, you know, either they have you have more exposure, and then they can filter that to filter a lot of people. You know that they're really putting the intention to find a job there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. It sounds like it's really worth paying. Even if at first you're like, oh, I don't know if it's going to be worth it. 
to to have access I would, to I would. gloves. Yeah. I do want to ask you about the elephant in the room here. Maybe this is what some people are thinking. How, how do you think the Google Translate and all of this translation software has affected your job? Do you already think it's taken some of your work or what are you seeing out there in the industry? Oh, for sure. I mean, Google Translate before, you know, AI refine and is doing things so differently now. Google Translate, you know, has been around for years. So there's always been you know, companies and people that what will, first of all, want you to do, we call it post-machine uh, proofreading or post-machine post translation, which they submit all the work to, to like Google Translate, and then you have to proofread it. I personally, and this is where I learned in school, and um, we, we reject this kind of job because it takes you longer to do it. You have to redo it. And you know, you get paid like a fraction of what you would have gotten paid if you translated the document. And the quality is always compromised. And as AI is getting better and more like accurate with translations, of course, a lot of people tend to just use it, AI to translate. But the question here is, if you have a serious company that wants to like provide serious material, especially when it's like specific industries, you know, like medical or engineer, engineering or, you know, or you have of, or marketing is very important for your company. Um, I think companies are delaying a lot of like leaving all of their translations for AI because you want to make sure they want to make sure like the, you know, like the texts that are being delivered to their clients are a hundred percent. And the only way to really know that is to have a translator and a proofreader that are like certified and have experience in the tools, especially the experience in the and in the field to translate it. So I'm sure, you know, we're getting replaced little by little, but uh, companies that are really serious about this are not doing that switch unless, I don't know, like until they know that it's going to be a hundred percent accurate, you know. Sounds like the way ChatGPT is working right now too. I feel like you're not caring much about your standards if you're just letting ChatGPT straight up, straight up do it, right? 100%. I mean, it's easy if you want to like know the meaning of something really quick, but if you're going to like translate a document on a medical study or, you know, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to trust that because you don't know a specific, also um, depending on the country, you can speak the same language, but there's also like a lot of country specific translations because things can be misunderstood. So I think, especially like I said, for very serious clients, it's hard for I can right now to like switch everything to AI. I'm sure it will happen at some point, but I don't know if we're going to see it just now. Okay. So would you encourage people to still seek out trying to find some translation work? Because I know some people are thinking, why should I start putting my energy towards this? It's going to be replaced by AI in two years. I mean, it depends. There's a lot of work, jobs that are like, in the line, you know, copywriters, proofreaders, translators, like with, with AI. But I will say, I mean, it's a job that I really like. It's a job that I still hope I can maintain for a while with my clients. And I would, I would, I think it's a very, if you like it, if you like translated proofreading, you know, it's a really generous job that you can find, you know, there's still need for translators in a lot of fields all the time, different industries. It's very important to, I think, specialize in the field. It's, you know, like if you do do your research and find out you, you, from your language pairs, why is the most like sought for industry and specializing in an industry, because depending on what you, uh, what you specialize in, you can get a lot of opportunities. Where do you see the most demand in terms of language and industry, would you say? Or... I'll say a lot of right now is a lot of um, automotive uh robotics uh environmental um what else i think automotive and robotics will be like number one for sure also law oh yes like you mentioned the court interpreting was one i've seen a lot of jobs actually yes for legal interpretation legal proofreading um yeah. and and what languages i don't know if you're you know always looking at the different ones because you've you're already specialized but if somebody's mm -hmm. watching and they have a particular language that they can translate in or they're fluent in, what is really popular these days or where's all this automotive 
ro ro uh, robotic translation languages. I mean, the automotive and the robotic, there's mostly like from German. A lot of it is German or, but I would say the most uh, sought for are the ones that people speak the least. Uh, because, you know, like Spanish, English, there's a lot of, or English, Spanish, there's like the pool is really big. So you have a lot of translators, you have a lot of work too. But there's language like Japanese or Arabic or different languages that people are not, you know, choosing to train on that are very sought for, I would think. I would think Japanese to German would probably be really good. Yeah, yeah that'll be good. And like uh, German to Japanese too. Yeah. And I know like sometimes you have a country that's really big, like I'm thinking of Saudi Arabia, like I know they opened up to the world and they yeah. probably have a lot of translation that they're going to start needing. And if you can, you know, speak languages that are going to pair with that, it's, it's going to be, there's going to be as an onslaught of work potentially. That's true. Also the EU languages too are important because there's also always documents being translated into some of the EU languages. Uh, how much work would you say that you get because you're able to do Spanish to German? Because I know that is more special than Spanish to English. Like you said, there's a lot German of... Is, German to Spanish, actually, because you're supposed to translate into your mother tongue. Oh, yes. I, that's how I think I got most of my work at the beginning, because when I only did English to Spanish, it was, you know, I was studying and I, like I didn't have a niche. I was, you know, didn't have a lot of experience. But as soon as it started, like, incorporate German to my work, I, it opened up, you know, a pool of clients, so many clients, there were a lot of like country specific that they have like plants in Mexico, they wanted to translate all their manuals, and everything from German to Mexico for the workers, for the clients, like, you know, car manuals, I did like a lot of Volkswagen and different translations. So I will say, um, for me, German to Spanish, I open up a lot of clients, like a lot, a lot of clients, but also niche again. And it, like, I specialize in automotive and robotics. So that helped a lot. Yes. So I'm thinking if you're a German person, a German, a native German speaker watching this, and you also are fluent in Arabic and you're living in Germany, this would be perfect to start trying to think about, you know, here's a remote job well, I might be able to get. Actually, if you speak any other language and you study German and you study translation, you can translate into your mother tongue from German, which is yeah. like, you know, because you're supposed, again, to translate into your mother tongue. So if you train as a translator and choose German as one of your language pairs, uh, so if you do German source to target, uh, to your target language, which is your mother tongue, is a good idea, I think. Definitely. I have to ask you, why did you study German, Christy? Because of the same reason. Because what I realized when I graduated and I went on the website and I saw how many people were offering the English to Spanish pair, like language pair, I kept thinking, like, I need to find a language that will attract more clients that needs more uh, translators. So German was like a very, not sad for, not popular language, obviously, for a reason, because it's pretty hard. Like for me... It was complicated to learn German, but for work was really good. And as soon as I graduated and I started incorporating to my to my work um, profile, I started to get in a lot to get a lot of requests. And I realized, okay, this is. I mean, it was a, it was like part. It was part research, part like logical, being like, okay, how many industries there is like there are in Latin America that you know that are like German source or. You know, so I realized there was a lot of need for that. Fantastic. I'm glad that you were thinking so far ahead. Yeah, thanks. But yeah, I ended up right now, I'm only uh, translating English to Spanish, but that can change. Yeah. I know this is going to be a very broad question, but do you have any tips for if people get their first translation job, what they need to make sure of when they when they get started to do a, a higher quality translation? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, first of all, get a training, right? Get some formal training on translation and make sure uh, that the client, make sure you specialize in the topic you're, you're working, read a lot because, you know, we're translators, we're not dictionary. So we're not going to know all of the words, all of the topics immediately. So when you get a job, make sure you really read on the topic. You have to read, you know, you're learning things every day because since you like switch clients and they're different, they're from different fields. You need to like really 
um, familiarize yourself with a lot of the topics and we don't know all of them. So it's really good before you start tra like a translation job to to start reading on the topic, to get more information about it. If you don't like, when I did a lot of engineering, if I didn't know a term or something, I will call an engineer and be like, okay, can you explain this to me? And they'll explain it to me. And then I'll, you know, you, you, you start getting your own, you start building your own glossary with all the terms that you know not, like, you know, you start to get to know. So I think that's it, like, you know, inform yourself, research, and of course, do like train yourself on translation and proofreading, copywriting. Yeah, I think that tip you just mentioned is so, so useful. Like if about engineering, if you know an engineer, just call them up or email them and ask like in layman's terms, how something works. And then it's going to help you so much. Yeah, with describing, of course. I also wanted to ask you finally, um, we've mentioned one platform. Do you have any other places that you recommend people go to look for translation jobs? That's the one I use. I normally, I went to that one when I first started. I, I know there's another one called Translators Cafe and there's a few now. Also, there's a lot of freelance uh, websites now that people are using like Fiverr or Upwork. I haven't used any of that for translation, but I know a lot of people are using that for like translators, proofreaders, designers. So I haven't used that, but I think Cross will be my number one to start with. Well, thank you very much for that tip because I, I'm sure I, I hadn't heard of that when you first mentioned it to me. And hopefully people can go, they can get the paid version to get like a, take a shortcut and start finding these jobs. And hopefully people that didn't think they could have a remote job so quickly, if they've got the skills and they want to start and work hard, they can start with a translation job. Yeah, I will I will strongly recommend to do so if you're into languages and you are able to access training on that. Uh, it will be good. It will be good because um, you can take it everywhere. You can travel everywhere and work online with these clients and you learn so much. It's such a beautiful work because... Every day you're learning different things about different topics. It's, you know, it's never not it's never a boring day with translation. Yeah, you ne you never know what's going to come next. Well, Christy, thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything else that you would like to share before we go? You're very welcome. No, like if anyone has a question, I'm here to help. I'm happy to um help you whatever I can. So, but thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, and I hope you have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.